When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's share. Share is Italian for love. But they, Dean Martin couldn't get the rights to her name, so he had to like reinvent the Italian language. A lot of people don't know that. Look, I think it's important in this age of disinformation that we say that is not true. <laughs> None of that is true. We'll put an asterisk, whatever the just, or, oral equivalent, equivalent of an asterisk is. Asterisk? Just, asterisk. Asterisk. I always say asterisk. Just. And I was corrected once in a meeting, and I was hugely humiliated. Ooh, wow. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. oh man, I'm so embarrassed. I'm going to drink my espresso in peace. <laughs> and I was like, vice versa, y'all, vice versa. We should probably put a disclaimer. None of the things that we say are probably true. Don't listen to this. <laughs> what, a great, what a great podcast intro. Don't listen to this. <laughs> hey, welcome to Your Inner Child is an Idiot, the podcast where we look back on things from our childhood and see if they're any good. My name is DJ. My name is Damon. Hi, DJ. I almost didn't quite make it through that intro. <laughs> Unlike literally every episode that we ever do, you're going to have to really carry this one, Damon, because <laughs> I've never seen Moonstruck. I barely know what it is. I confuse it with Moonlighting in my head. Mm -hmm. Moonlighting mm -hmm. is a television show with Sybil Shepard and Bruce Willis. That is correct. And this is with Cher and Nicolas Cage. So your leading okay. men both are dealing with male pattern baldness, but ended sure. in on the exact opposite spectrums of what Aren't to do all? about it. <laughs> <laughs> Nicolas Cage fought it with money, I guess, I assume. Yeah. I, um, if if Nicolas Cage does anything, it's usually with money. Uh, yeah, as whether the he has it or not. To. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was this Cher's breakout uh, acting role? Because she was the in this and she, she was like, a lot more into acting at this in this era, like in the yeah, late eighties, early nineties. I mean, 90s. she was in Silkwood before this, and I mean, she had been in a few things. This, I mean, she, this won her an Oscar, so this was probably a really. I okay. mean, this is no doubt a big moment for her. But she had been in movies before this. She always sort of straddled that line. I mean, with the uh, you know with the Sunny and Cher show, that's true. While also yeah. releasing, yeah. you know, so um, it's only really now. I was thinking about this the other day because uh, we were watching the fuck were we watching oh we caught uh the witches of eastwick on tv the other day um and i was like why isn't sharing anything anymore she stopped wanting to be i assume was part of it well because she, now she's on twitter and yeah oh, she's riot. <laughs> she is having a good time on twitter <laughs> i don't know if she's laughing with us or i'm just laughing at her but i'm happy she's there you know, it's kind of one of those like like a self aware grandma kind of vibe where it's like she knows like what she's doing, but also like she doesn't quite get it, but also in a way where it like she gets it enough that it's actually yeah better she's than fifty five percent there yeah she's fifty five percent in on the joke she's a million percent better at at any social media than I am like I can't I can't fault her for any of it like I can't. I can't pretend like I'm judging her from a, from a heightened state or anything. Me and Tyler like to quote one share tweet. Um, I can't remember what she was being criticized for, but some share <laughs> uh, had said uh, something like, "I'm never going to do this again." It was very like liberal, sort of uh, a liberal stance, and I'm not going to do this anymore. And one of her, one of the followers, an older woman, says, "I'll believe it when I see it." And share responded with, "Keep your eyes open, bitch." <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it still makes me laugh anew, as if it was the first time I was hearing it. Every time I think of it. And you can imagine Just a saying, fucking national treasure. Saying it in her voice, then be like, how? <laughs> oh. uh, there are a lot of drag queens who get really angry if you do the standard uh, share impression. Im Is that right? Uh, there was one, one of the contestants on RuPaul's Drag Race, Chad Michaels, has sort of made his name doing Cher. Like, he's pretty much more than a drag queen, just a Cher impersonator. And uh, he gets really mad if you do the standard, like, hair flip, hair toss. Uh, tongue curl. He's like, Cher's never done that. And the best part is that one time when she was in the workroom, RuPaul uh, did the 
the standard share impression, tongue roll and hair toss. And uh, everyone just sort of stared at Chad, like waiting to see what he would do. But of course, he was like, well, this is the judge of the show, so I'm not going yeah, to right. say anything here. There's been so many, it's like Elvis, like already a cartoonish character, but in, on, in her own right. And right. then there's been so many like interpretations, caricatures, uh, impressions that you kind of almost, it all blends together. Like, I don't You're actually know. You're just doing know. an impression of an impression of an impression. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, it's like a hello, Clarice comes from like Jim Carrey and Cable Guy rather than the actual movie. But it's like, yeah, but it's the idea. You get you, it. You know what I'm <laughs> referencing. Um, so you've never seen this movie. I have track? no idea what any of this is about. That's why we're talking about share impressions and <laughs> RuPaul's Drag Race. I have no frame of reference. I came to this This movie- is the one where she's got the really risque bathing suit and she's on a, a battleship. With sailors, right? <laughs> yes. This is okay. that one. Um, and then this is also the one where she becomes a mermaid somehow. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and she also turns back time and she also and there's like, uh, believes in life after love. <laughs> and there's like eight different shares like in the, in the show, like with her. Mm-hmm. Multiplicity. That was, a, mm-hmm. that, was a broad, that was a Broadway reference of the share show. <laughs> You're welcome. This Culture. one, this one is a, a favorite of my mother's. And so I didn't watch it. Uh, when I was young because I thought of it as a mom movie and I was like, I sure. ain't watching that. I'm Steel boy. Magnolia situation. Exactly. Yeah. And then you realize, oh, mom was right uh, all along. <laughs> I, I can't remember what finally spurred me to watch it, but I did and I like, it instantly shot up my list of favorite movies to just watch whenever. Mm. It's a really great rom-com, uh, but it also is, um, it's really great in that everyone in the movie sort of gets a moment to shine. It's not just about Cher and Nicolas Cage. It's about this whole family and they all get like a story beat without feeling labored or like bloated. And it's like overwhelmingly romantic without ever feeling like cloying or like, Mm. yeah, cheesy. I absolutely love it. I can't pretend that I don't. And I remember one time at work, I was trying to uh, antagonize a younger employee coworker into watching it. And I told her that she but you couldn't watch, watch it, it if you tried. <laughs> and then I told her to stop hitting herself because she kept hitting herself with her hands. I imagine you do like a clockwork orange style, like <laughs> you got her strapped into a chair. But I told, also told her that she's going to watch it and she's going to find herself sexually attracted to Nicolas Cage. And she's going to have to deal with that. And she's like, that's not going to happen. That's a big bet. And uh, she watched it and she admitted I was right. Wow. So what kind of, what kind of, uh, NC performance am I in for? What kind of Nicolas Cage am I about to witness here? Uh, it is off the rails. I mean, okay. in a very, I mean, he is supposed Excellent. to be a very uh, dramatic man in this. And so he tends to uh, react very strongly to things. Um, so Nicolas Cage gets to sort of the, the future Nicolas Cage would have appreciated playing this now yeah. because he would get to chew all the scenery. But I think he was young enough and sort of still in artistic Nicolas Cage mode right? where it really works for the movie. Which he's kind of back, but just like on the backside of it. Like he's back in that zone now, like where he just does like sometimes like small you art know. house movies. But it's like it's a, di- it's a different kind of funhouse mirror version of himself. <laughs> Well, I mean, I I feel like this this has happened before where he's like he was cuz he just did that movie Pig, which I wanted to see and it was it was pretty good. But then like a few years ago he did this movie Joe and everyone's like Nicolas Cage is back. He's not going to be doing those stupid movies no more. And then he was like in Left Behind the next year. And we're like, "Oh, I guess he just sort of needs to pay the bills." He just he's like a movie a month. Whatever whatever it takes. Let's do this. If you can meet my fee, I will do your movie. Yeah. Although one time I got, I gained a lot of respect from him. He was like in some sort of like press thing and they were doing a stupid, like they named his quote, like a quote from a movie of his and he had to guess the movie and he got them all right. There was something yeah. about that I found really charming. He's because he does a lot of shitty movies, right? but he was like, oh yeah, that's, that's Moonstruck. Oh yeah, that's Snake Eyes. Oh yeah, that's Face Off. Um, I don't know what happened. What, was it the tax evasion? Was it the tax evasion that ruined Nicolas Cage? Because even when he's like in things like Face Off, where it's a ludicrous movie, I don't think he's. It I, still he's, works. He's just but now like he's in just a, sort of in these shite movies. Well, I think he's more just like a. He's taking a shotgun approach. It just seems like he's <laughs> just like 
you know, maybe, and maybe it's because, you know, he needs the money or whatever, but like, I mean, how much does he owe? Like, he makes a lot of money for I mean, movies. does he still owe that mu- much? Because, I mean, that story broke, like, in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. That was, like, a while ago. But he still st- seems to be buying, like, dinosaur heads True. Um, that he has yeah. to then return. Yeah, so he's a man of expensive taste. I don't know. But it's just, uh, he seems, like, more, he's just game to act. Like, he, he's a guy who seems to like the job, which I appreciate. And I do, I do think that, like, he might just be a weird guy, and that's, like, yeah okay cool but the weird thing is like he's definitely got a thing but his thing is really wide ranging you Mm -hmm. know what i mean like it's you really never know what you're in for and it's really enjoyable because like he does the sincere thing and it's kind of off-putting but he puts this little little nicholas cage switch so if you if you get it just right like the right director the right script the right kind of story the right people surrounding him like it really really works but it but it can be really weird like if he's in just like a normal like hey i'm a uh like a husband and i love you it's it's all like it's all like ah it's kind of like that um james franco it's the james franco vibe uh uh, very serious allegations notwithstanding where it's like if he plays sincere you're like, oh, this is not right. I get Whereas that vibe. He plays from- goofy and it works. Well, okay. Let me let me uh, let's <laughs> stri- let's strike the whole James Franco <laughs> thing from the record. Is it Robin Williams? You want to go with Robin Williams? That's the one that always puts no, me. No, because off. that's Sincere that's Robin you. Williams bothers me so much. I don't I don't feel that. I understand what you're saying, but I don't feel the same way. So I don't have but an he's example. Also sort of. Uh, Nicholas Cage is also getting to the point where he also doesn't look like a normal person anymore. I mean, he never, he was always a, a striking, a striking there you go. looking person. There you go. Um, but now he looks like, I mean, his hair is jet black. He looks like he's pasted on a beard uh, stubble onto his face. Like it looks like something he would have done for like a part in a play. Like it looks like a fake beard. His <laughs> teeth are like brontosaurus teeth, like straight across. Um, everything about him looks weirdly constructed. So if he, and so obviously he's trying to play like a younger man. So when he's in these movies where he's playing, like I'm just a father of a five-year-old girl. I'm like, no, you're not. You're a 65 year old man, or however the hell old you are. Although in Pig, like he looks like a, like a fucking ent walking out of the woods. He's so weird looking that it actually works. But anytime he plays a normal person, like I'm not interested. You want to look up how old he is? I do. I'm looking up Nicholas K. Age. Oh, I didn't understand that. Uh, 57. Oh. Well, by the time this comes out, I'll be 58. So, oh, another year around the sun. Happy birthday, Mickey. I think we've said enough. Let's watch this movie. Watch along with us. We're going to watch Moonstruck for Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's. Happy Valentine's. Should have said that at the front, but Valentine's. Yeah. It's Whoops. around a holiday. Oh, uh, Cupid just hit me with an arrow. Why is this the thing? I am bleeding out. <laughs> but I'm in love and on the way out. Damn I've fallen it, I love in love you. as I bleed out. <laughs> is it like love potion number nine where like it's when I get when I get struck, whoever I'm looking at, like, does this count? Because I we're thought like that was the myth screen? of Cupid was that you, yeah, you would, you would fall in love with me or you'd but fall I, in love with your computer. I was gonna say, does it have to be in person? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, for some reason, Greek myth never approached the yeah. idea of, <laughs> really? of screens and seeing someone from far away via a screen. Really missed opportunity there. Cupid, what's the deal with Zoom? Would would that work? <laughs> Why didn't Orpheus cover all this? <laughs> if uh, one of you wants to uh, donate to us, patrons become one of our patrons. Yes, uh, you can support uh, go us. To, uh, you're in a ch- you're in a child's an idiot. You're in a bambino. Isn't it? Oh, but don't. Uh, that's not. That's not the. Yeah, you actually. We didn't set up that for. That's redirect. not the URL. That. That's actually a three hundred one redirect. We didn't set that up. We'd have to buy the DNS. Now we I gotta to go buy the domain. Let me type it redirect. in. Let me go oh, find it's too it. Too much. But you can become a patron. Get special episodes. Go daddy dot oh, okay. yeah, okay. Your 
And uh, are you anyway, insinuating that Italians can't log into websites in a timely <laughs> fashion? Is that is that a stereotype I'm not as familiar with? I know that they go down pipes, they beat <laughs> turtle kings, right? They're all associated with the mob. They make and they all love their mothers. They make a hell of a pasta. Yeah, in a bambino is a gagoots. <laughs> Your jabroni over here. Is this? Uh, I feel bad doing this. I'm gonna no, stop. No, it feels actually out of control at this point. Okay, just so we're clear, <laughs> your inner bambino is an idiot.com is available. So, so if you'd be. like that website, we will not fight you on it. But go to your child is an idiot.com. Get extra episodes. Get uh, drawings. Get what do we do? Uh, you get your name read in the credits. You oh get your yeah, name the, the reading the of the credits. Oh, uh, you get bonus episodes. You can ask us questions. I mean, you can do that anyway. I mean, we'll probably answer if you want. <laughs> You're in ShazenIdiot.com. Over here, etc. And we are back. We watched Moonstruck. When the, the moon it's here. Actually, that's, I think we're actually the Dean Martin estate. Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's we'll all we can sing know. of it. It just, you can say when the, and then that's it. Yeah. Otherwise, if you name many. any heavenly body or <laughs> any Italian dish after that, you're fucked. Let me tell you. Would you please recap this movie for both for me and for the audience at large? Oh, okay. Um, I thought it was going to be one of those like we go into a confessional and I tell you the plot of a movie there. <laughs> And then the audience just sits in silence. Uh, this movie uh, set in Brooklyn, New York, uh, follows an Italian-American family. And uh, Loretta, Loretta Castorini is a widow, a young widow. Young for widows, a middle-aged woman otherwise, um, played by Cher. She's 37 years old. Her husband was hit by a bus several years ago. Um, she's dating Danny Aiello at the beginning of it. He's kind of a mama's boy. But then she starts sleeping with his brother when he's uh, when he's gone home to Sicily. But in the meantime, she also finds out that her father is cheating on her mother. She finds out that love exists in many various ways across the Italian-American community of Brooklyn, New York in the 80s. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she goes to the opera and decides uh, that she wants to be with Ronnie, Nicolas Cage, rather than Johnny, Danny Aiello. And, you know, all the other things just sort of fall as they might. That was pretty good. Thank that was you. Uh, wow. You can't say it's not a brief summation of Moonstruck. Yeah, that was good. This was I did not know. I've never this, seen you be in awe of a recap. I've was really, done. It was really good. Uh, there's usually a lot more. It's <laughs> usually a lot more. Uh, a lot more faff. Aside, let's be honest. <laughs> a bit of a faff. Um, <laughs> bit of a faff. Extremely Italian. Very Italian. Aggressively Italian. Or, or Italian American, I should say. I have sort of a like culturally milk toast Midwestern upbringing, and I'm very I love my family. It's nothing against that, but I I sort of wish that we had a more a heritage that was more rich in like that sort of like cultural like basically I have a lot of heritage to where like it got too assimilated. You know what I mean? <laughs> where uh-huh. which is you know like it's hard to complain about because it comes with all the benefits that it comes with, but it wasn't like uh like whatever enclave you know when when you know immigrant communities come and then they basically what happens is they they have more people like them around them so they have you know little little italy portions of neighborhoods it happens with a lot of things and that's well i mean that that probably also is uh tied to america's rejection of of certain immigrants uh, throughout its history why they do Oh, do you have black hair get the fuck out of here get out of here or like go to this one below 49th yes You can only live here. And then, you know, over time, we take turns on who we get, who we're prejudiced against. Like now, Italians are cool, but uh, not, not, not that long ago, <laughs> you know. So yeah. I have some sort of like minor, like, oh, I wish that I had that because it comes with that sort of like just genuine pride in your culture and also the food. The food. I I mean, I have a very similar feeling watching this movie. Uh, I think a lot of people assume because both my first and last name are F5 Greek levels um, (laughs) that that I'm like, it's my big fat Greek wedding every every room I walk into. My fingers are sticky from baklava and (laughs) um, my breath smells of feta and I'm just drinking ouzo left, right, and center. But we're actually also a similarly milk toast uh, family um, with, you know, 
a box of feta in the fridge. That's about the the only difference. <laughs> um, so yeah, there is a, a weird longing when I watch this movie of um, this movie romanticizes a lot of things, um, yes. but it, it romanticizes romance, Italian. For example, <laughs> for example, it it has a meta romanticization of romance, but you also get this feeling of a really tight knit community, a really tight knit family within that tight knit community. It just also, for some reason, makes me want to walk around uh, 1980s New York, which everything I've read about 1980s New York tells me the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> the, that I do not want to you do. You don't that. want to do that. Yeah. I don't want to be kicking a can down the road after, uh, you know, getting fucked by a baker. Spe- <laughs> for example. This is uh, jumping ahead a bit in my notes, but I will say that speaking of romanticizing romance, uh, main Lauren quote for this movie is Is this supposed to be romantic? <laughs> because <laughs> it is uh, very, it is very rough around the edges, this, the, the relationships, um, because they're, it's messy. In an emotional yes. sense. Yeah. And uh, it's also I would like, say purposefully messy. Like, I, I think it is, it's glamorizing the messiness of. Well, and like you, our main character, or our main couple, which is Cher and Nicolas Cage, are like, I mean, Cher seems, uh, Cher's character is, is less so, but he's kind of, he's kind of terrible. Like, he's <laughs> like. He, <laughs> he is a very dramatic man. Um, yeah. I don't think he's terrible, but he is ridiculous in a sense that I think the movie would also agree. He is ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it's definitely um, played for last. It's definitely he's on purpose. Very, yeah. uh, he's very dramatic. Um, I mean, he loves the opera, and I, I think operatic would be an appropriate uh, mm. adjective for him. Do you, uh, is this, just let's just get, us, get this out of the way. Is no, this, go ahead. I know where this is going. Is this the hottest Nicolas Cage has ever been? Absolutely. Because okay. now he looks like a weird... Uh, the funny thing is, I was looking up the IMDb for this uh, movie, as one is uh, want to do after watching it and then about to review it on a podcast, <laughs> I'd hope. And it had like a modern picture of Nicolas Cage in there, you know, in the <laughs> cast list. And I was like, he's not in this movie. This, Who's this other man? fellow, uh, the Raising Arizona guy who died shortly after, um, <laughs> is in this movie. It's almost amazing how little... Nicholas Cage looks like Nicholas Cage now or then. He is very a different looking person than he was. I just said uh, my notes were Nikki Coppola looking foin from the back. <laughs> That's what I and I typed Absolutely. it that way. Uh, I mean, they treat him foin. like the Phantom of the Goddamn Opera in his first scene. He yeah. he works in a bakery, presumably his bakery. It is called the Camerary Brothers Bakery, and the first shot we get is when Cher calls. He has bad blood between him and his brother yes. Danny Aiello yeah. and Danny Aiello before uh, he's to be married to Cher he asks her to reach out to Ronnie while he's in Italy to invite him to the wedding and so she does that she calls the bakery and we just get like a, sh- a backlit shot of just like a broad shouldered back sweaty in an A, uh, a, a he's cut, working the coal uh, mines shirt. of the bakery yeah, yeah. and um it's very Phantom of the Opera, I think, and also um, it is the hottest that Nicolas Cage has ever been. Hands he, down. Despite the fact that he is missing a tooth, yeah. the rest of said teeth are, you can't tell which one's the snaggle tooth. Like, they're just all just shooting out <laughs> in different directions. He's got uh, crazy eyebrows um, that looks like a, a, do- a crying dog in a cartoon, and his hair is just like, he looks like a cartoon who's been electrocuted for most of it until he finally yeah, goes to the opera. Yeah. He's a, me- a mess. I would argue that it's weirdly Nicolas Cage's charisma, a phrase I never thought I'd say, <laughs> uh, that makes him sexier. But I mean, the hairy chest and, and everything else doesn't hurt. I I think I owe Cher an, a mental apology because I've always thought of her as like just sort of strange looking. And I think that... That that happens a lot with super famous people. Is there's something about them that is not that is either above or just abnormal, and that's part of the reason they have like some some on screen chemistry or some you know they have some when they walk in the room they're noticed. You know, it's because right. they don't look like everyone else, or they do in such a way that it's like chiseled. You know what I mean? Like it's not <laughs> fair. And I always thought of like Cher as as like kind of weird looking in my mind, and it could have gotten like kind of this era Cher. Like I've seen her, you know. 
or recently, and this is not this. This is the opposite of a judgment. I'm like being really parsing what I say because I want to be very careful because you're I don't. You're doing great. It doesn't sound like you're scrambling at all. <laughs> well, I don't. I think it's important to take away those sort of judgments. But I also want to acknowledge that I felt this way as a as a kid and and to a lesser extent, but still there as a young adult. Where I'm like, oh, just shares just like weird look. It doesn't doesn't do it for me. As if like who gives a shit? Says right? five year old DJ. Exactly. But not uh, my scene, man. You scream while watching uh Silkwood. <laughs> but of the main characters, she's like the most <laughs> normal looking one. <laughs> First off, yes, a Cher is a very, um, I think she's gorgeous, but she is a very specific looking woman. She has these heavy lids, this Roman nose, this long face. And in this, I mean, after her makeover, she has oh this my God, it's triangle so, of hair, hair on hair is, on hair. Um, the hair gets enormous. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it just fills the frame. So it just looks like she's like a, a silhouetted face just floating in space. Um but in this, what I like about this is that they take, we have we have oddly sexy Nicolas Cage and then oddly unglamorous Cher, at least at the beginning of the movie, where she's a widower. She usually keeps her hair like tied back in a messy bun. She has like these wispy grays, or as one of the hairdressers says, these ugly grays later on in the movie. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I love it. And I she she... I mean, I, I haven't seen a lot of Cher movies. That's actually, I don't think that's even true. I mean, I actually have seen a lot of Cher movies. I even saw that Farrelly Brothers movie where it's Matt Damon and Greg Kinnear are like conjoined twins yeah, and she yeah. had a cameo in Stuck it. Stuck with you. Uh, yeah. But uh, <laughs> she, she's, I think she's absolutely amazing in this movie. I think she really sells... Uh, being a, like a superstitious widow, like who has a very re- re- believable relationship with uh, her parents and almost everyone around her. I absolutely love her in this movie. At any moment, I just like watching her. Uh, she's great with, I mean, sometimes I think with singers who become actors, you can tell like uh, when they're not uh, saying their lines, they just sort of shut down. <laughs> They're like, I'm right. waiting for him so, to stop talking now so it's I my can turn. say my yeah. part. But I think she, at any point, like I would look over at Sharon. She's doing something interesting or reacting in some like believable way. One of the things I noted this time was when her first scene with Vincent Gardinia, when she comes in to announce that she's, that Danny Aiello's proposed to her, or as she kept saying, proposed marriage to her. She had already said to Danny Aiello that she was concerned about bad luck in her previous marriage because she didn't go through all the the traditional motions of getting uh, engaged. And then she encounters Vincent Gardinia, who sort of takes the same argument, which is like, you have bad luck. Don't get married again, Loretta. It doesn't work for you. Um, And she sort of takes the opposite approach. She immediately takes the opposite side of the debate than she had with Danny Aiello earlier, which one could argue is like uh, confusing writing, but I think is actually very believable writing uh, for a child talking to their parent. Like the minute the parent takes one stance of the debate, your immediate goal is to take the opposite stance, even if it was counter to what you said five minutes ago. Like she sort of regrets. Dresses. Right. Yeah. What What are we doing here with this wedding in a month? Like, what is this? What like What is happening here? Because they're very clearly like. So, one of my frustrations with with this movie is like I kind of don't understand what they're doing with the Danny Aiello character. Like, like he he doesn't seem to want to propose. But he seems he to be doing it under your dress. Yeah, um, but then he does, well, and then she insists on doing it in a month, which is like, listen. I work in the wedding industry pretty regularly. <laughs> That's bonkers. I mean, you could do it. That's true. I mean, it was 30 years ago, I which still, is still. No, you're absolutely right. But I mean, sometimes I, I remember talking to my grandma about my mother's wedding, which was still 20 years earlier. I think our generation does not appreciate how much the wedding industrial complex has risen up during our lifetimes to become. Mm. I'm not saying like a month is not a long time. Yeah. And no, you're right. I think yeah. Uh, she also is a father who is very wealthy is is the feeling I get throughout things that characters blatantly express throughout the movie that uh, what's his name Cosmo Castorini uh, is pretty well off. Um, you're rich as Roosevelt. You're just cheap Cosmo. But yeah, I think that is a speedy wedding. 
but I think she just sort of wants to get it done because she's an older woman. And uh, I don't think she will probably like go all out, but yeah, I think she just yeah. wants to do things by the books and get also things like as she can get them. Second wedding, always a little bit. That's know? true. It's like, yeah. okay, we, we know we're in love. We've been through this before. I got it. When he, okay, so he. Although she's not in love. She likes him a lot. Mm, mm. Even does she though? <laughs> Great question. She leaves, so he leaves because his mom is dying in Sicily. That's true. That's actually happening. It's not like some sort of weird thing. But is it? why? Why is it played for laughs? Because she's not driving, dying. Or he just thinks she's dying because she's sick. I don't. I don't understand why that's funny. I, I mean, understand not, that some of the it's acting not is funny. Initially played for laughs, but as it goes on, it seems to be uh, as as. Uh, Johnny Camerary. I always get them confused. It's Ronnie Camerary as Nicolas Cage and Johnny Camerary as Danny Aiello. It's apparent that he is very much a mama's boy and needs to be taken care of. I do like when he what, calls what is, from Palermo and he says, I am calling from the deathbed of my mother. And it's like, okay, dude, we know where you are. But it's why, such a drama queen moment to say, I'm calling from the deathbed of my mother. Why is it apparent that he needs... Caretaking, what did I miss? Like what? Other than well, that. Well, I mean, that first than... scene in the Italian restaurant when we meet him. Oh, yeah, he wants Cher, his woman to. Okay, that. Yeah. He yeah, laughs. Yeah. He laughs at. Uh, yeah. John Mahoney, uh, Fraser's dad, who's at another table who gets water thrown in his face. Yeah. Um, and he laughs and says, a Can't man control. who cannot control his woman is yeah. funny, which is such a stilted reading of that line. <laughs> it, always, it always makes me laugh. It makes me think of Joe Montaigne in and, and The Simpsons, where he's like <laughs> doing an impression of himself doing a gangster voice, you know? <laughs> But I mean, we also see that uh, she she mentions, I want you to get down on your knees and propose. That's how a man should do it. And he's like, but this is a good suit. And she's like, I know. I helped you pick it out. It came with two pairs of pants. And then when he tries to order the fish, she's like, don't order the fish. It's too oily. It's going to give you a bad base for your stomach. You get get in the air. You're going to turn green around the gills. It's, I think she is a very caretaking mm. person. And I think we see her like interact with almost all people, and she is sort of, she's very confident in who she is. Like, she's not a demure character, which I like. And I think there's probably a part of her aspect, or part of her character is that she likes the idea of taking care of this man. Mm. But then he, we when when uh, she tells her dad she's going to get married to this man, he's like, he's a big baby. What are you talking about? And then, uh, and then when he's, you know, at his deathbed of his mother, he's crying, and his mom, who's on her deathbed, is just like waving at him, like, shut up. Uh, like put out by her own death. There's also a feeling, um, this isn't absolutely clear, and I don't think it needs to be understood, but this time watching it, when he comes back for the final scene, when all when everyone's in the kitchen, um, he says, I told my mother we were to be married, and she got well right away. And Ronnie, Nicolas Cage, also the son of this woman, says, I bet she did. Which makes me think that she is also a drama Germ queen. Uh, okay. okay. And might also perhaps fake a death to get her son to come home and then also stop faking that death to get him to stop marrying a woman that she does not care for. Uh, That's what I was telling you. You texted me um, when you had watched the first half of the movie and said, why is Cher just so dismissive of this dying woman? Uh, and I said, I think the feeling is mutual. And that I think is the, the conclusion of like, they both don't like each other. Right. I can't marry you. If I marry you, my mother will die. Mama's boy. I guess I just like, like it's clear that there's like, you know, when she meets, but this is before she meet, even meets Ronnie at this point. Right. That we're just like, it's very, very clearly played for laughs. I feel like, you know, it's, it's not like this maudlin, everybody's crying, sweet music. Well, even Danny Aiello doesn't seem, uh, even though I have described him as a mama's boy, he hasn't, he doesn't really, uh, he doesn't seem that bothered that his mother is dying. Maybe right. it's expected that she is dying. Or it's like, or it's like crocodile tears. You know what I mean? Like he's just kind of like playing along. But like, it seemed like well, I don't. I didn't. I didn't get it. I guess, and I still don't. <laughs> like I'm just like. I think I I I feel like your explanation works, but I did mm -hmm. not get that from the movie. Oh, and that uh, that could. I'm not saying that's on on the movie. I mean, it could just be on me. I just like I don't understand what happened there. <laughs> it also, I mean, there's also a feeling I got that Olympia Dukakis's character also does not care for this woman. Um, I don't know if this woman at some point lived in New York and moved back to Palermo. Right. But everyone seems to be aware of her. Because <laughs> uh, even when Danny Aiello tells Olympia Dukakis when Loretta's still out, 
he says, my mother got back. <laughs> Lipidococcus doesn't seem that, that bothered that there, a miracle has happened and this woman got instantaneously better. She doesn't even hide her face of just like, oh, okay. The liquor store couple that she runs into, that's different than the grocery store couple, right? Yeah. Okay. Because I really liked them and I wanted more of them. And then later when it was like the grocery store couple, I was like, that's different, right? That's like her, she's related to them. These people are just like people she knew. And I really liked their dynamic. They like give each other a hard time and then immediately they're like, like charming. This movie is all about people screaming and then immediately over it. Like yeah. instantaneously. Um, yeah, I do like, I feel like the liquor store couple is the movie hinting that the, I feel like this movie is, bo- it's not, it's got too much of a story to really be a character study or like, a, you know, short stories, but it borders Vignette, on being yeah. little vignettes of love. We do have them, and they're, they, that's where a share goes to pick up some, some Asti Spumanti to celebrate her engagement. Um, and she encounters a, a, the liquor store couple, one who is accusing, I don't think she's accusing me of cheating, but saying that he's leering at women. Yeah. Uh, you have the eyes of a wolf. I've, se- I've known a wolf in everyone I've ever met, and I see a wolf in you. Uh, and he says to her, you know what I see when I look at you? the girl I married. And she goes, oh. And then immediately they're like in loving mode suddenly. He just like knows the he, the button to push. Yeah, he's like, yeah. I know the Konami code to stop you from <laughs> yelling at me. Do you want to, um, I mean, we kind of touched on it when we were talking about how uh, steamy uh, Nicholas Cage is. Do you want to talk about their meet cute, <laughs> such as it is? <laughs> the immediate me- the immediate meeting <laughs> of these two characters, uh, Ronnie and what's her name? In this? Uh, Loretta Castellini. Loretta is, uh, as you mentioned, Loretta coming, Cher's character coming to the bakery to basically invite him to the wedding, ensure that he comes. Right. So she calls him initially and he he screams at her, what was done can never be made right and hangs up the phone on her. And she's like, animal. So she decides to go down to uh, the bakery, um, which this whole thing is Bizarre. absolutely insane in possibly the best way. So he, she goes down to the bakery. This whole she thing the, should be a one-act play, <laughs> just this. It's, I mean, I could watch it all day. Just shoot it directly into my veins, please. So Cher goes to the bakery. She goes to the cashier at the front desk. Chrissy is her name, as we'll learn later. Uh, and she says, hi, I'd like to speak to Ronnie. And Chrissy, uh, immediately on the offense, is like, what do you want? And she's like, I want to talk to him. And then Chrissy's eyes flare in a way that always sends me into hysterics. Like, what is your problem? So they go down to the basement. Chrissy guides her down to the basement. And they meet Ronnie, still in full, you know, Lon Chaney, fan of the opera mode down there. Does this, and first what, of all, were, were bakeries in the 80s, old Italian bakeries, like, <laughs> was he's like in the bowels of the Titanic? Like, in the... <laughs> Work in the it has doors in case engine. it gets flooded. We're going to leave the bakers in there. We can't <laughs> rescue everyone. Um, Follow I the imagine, rats. I imagine it's not a necessarily an eight, 1980s bakery. It's probably an 1880s bakery, and it's probably been it's that traditional. same street corner yeah. um, forever. So she goes down there to meet him in person, and he... I love this scene. It's kind of a shot, like, very choppy, which I don't necessarily appreciate. I wouldn't have minded if it was just one single shot on Nicolas Cage the entire time. Yeah, but yeah, he, I bet you wouldn't. <laughs> he that gives sound. this speech where he tells, tells Loretta what the bad blood between him and Johnny is. And what I love about this is that a lesser movie, I feel like, would save this and make it a bigger deal and make it the big reveal of, like, Act 2. But instead, this movie reveals it right at the beginning, and it's that um, Johnny came in, ordered some bread, as you are, as you probably would, uh, in a bakery. Right. And <laughs> Ronnie wasn't paying attention. He was putting bread in the slicer, and he got his hand mangled in the slicer, and now he has a prosthesis, a wooden prosthesis on, on his hand. I assume he lost all his fingers, because his palm is still visible. Yeah. Um, and... I love this because, again, a great sign that Loretta is a very strong, independent woman who just speaks her mind. Because she she goes, that's the bad blood between you and Johnny? And he goes, yeah, that's it. In a very, like, putty moment. And like, yeah, that's right. And she goes, that's not Johnny's fault. And there's, like, a weird pause. And then he, Nicolas Cage hits, like, a tin can and says, I don't care. I ain't no freaking monument to justice. 
uh, and just starts, he holds up his hand and points at it with his other hand and says, I lost my hand. I lost my bride because uh, the woman he was uh, engaged to left him once, once she found out, you know, that I had been maimed. She left me for another man. And then, <laughs> and then they decide to go up uh, to his apartment and like work things out. And then Chrissy. Wait, hold on. I was, oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, Chris, you, you might be getting ready to say Okay, this. I was just, I just want to say, so Chrissy then, who, by the way, is the cashier, she literally has had three lines. She goes, I love this man. <laughs> but he don't know it because I ain't never told him. Because ever since he lost his hand and his girl, he never want to date anyone again. And then the other girl who works there, she does this thing that I only notice every other time I watch this, which is she sort of consoles her um, by like almost brushing Chrissy's arm with her fingers, <laughs> but doesn't make contact. I love it. If you watch this ever again, keep an eye out for it. It's a real treat. <laughs> But you missed but the part where Chrissy sounds. Oh yes, I'm so sorry. You're right. And this is a line that me and Tyler <laughs> scream at each other often, even though, as you'll soon find out, is a very specific line. <laughs> he screams at Chrissy, who, by the way, Tyler asked while we were watching. He's like, "Who's managing the front desk?" <laughs> Always into logistics, that man. <laughs> <laughs> they can um, hear that there's a bell on the door. I'm sure they'll. Right. No one's in there right now. He goes, Chrissy, the knife behind you on the wall. Bring it to me. I'm gonna cut my throat. <laughs> um, and Chrissy says, No, Ronnie. Uh, <laughs> and he says, Chrissy, bring me the big knife. And then she says, in a very old timey turn of phrase, I tell you, I won't do it. <laughs> uh, this whole scene is deranged. <laughs> it's bizarre. I don't. But I think it's supposed to be deranged. I mean. On its face, it is ri ridiculous, but I think the movie, were it suddenly sentient and able to respond to questions, would agree with you that it is ridiculous and it's yes. supposed to be. Yeah. Um, and we get the, you know, the characteristic random volumes from Nicolas Cage, which always <laughs> is a, always treat. a treat. It's like he's been brought out of Austin Powers' uh, hyperfreeze. He actually, like, also, like, and I know this is, like, this is a comedy, and so you can kind of laugh at it more, but I, I guess, you know, especially <laughs> the more we learn about how... Uh, abusive uh, men can be in in private just like his violent outbursts <laughs> yeah uh flipping over the table and threatening to cut himself it's very uh not cute <laughs> <laughs> uh perhaps yeah i mean I, there is sometimes there are a few moments where i'm a little uncomfortable by nicholas cage's character but i don't know it doesn't bother me i think it's so arch that i i'm not that put out by it it's so ludicrous the way he's acting that it doesn't seem like I really need to call someone. Cher, don't do it. <laughs> Bring me the big knife. <laughs> I'm gonna so cut when, my throat. So when you yell to uh, Tyler about the big knife, what do you what do you say? What part do you say? I mean, that's it. I say, "Bring me the big knife." Bring me the big, and then the other person is supposed to shout back, "No, I Ronnie!" Or I tell you, I won't do it. <laughs> Oh God! It's a call and answer, you know, sort of like folk music. Who who are the grocery store couple? Is it like her? That is a Rose's Olympia Dukakis's brother and his wife okay. Raymond Sorry, and uncle. Rita Capomaggi. I liked them as well. They're, oh my God, aren't they? They're adorable. The best. They come in because they come in before, like uh, at the last scene, because <laughs> Cher works there. Well, she does. It sounds like she does accounting for a few different yeah, businesses that's right. She's in town. A, that's right. Because she went to she, the funeral home at first, then she yeah, goes right. to the okay. florist, and then she goes there. That was established. I forgot. But she's supposed to drop off their deposit, and she just forgets in all this because she <laughs> went to the bakery and then ends up going back to his apartment and all this. Or, right? Is that what happened? No, that's I don't know. she goes. Um, that's when she goes to the Met. And but I think That's when right. she picks up the deposit, she passes by uh, the salon, and she's like, you know what? Why don't That's I right. Yeah. So she she does not do it on purpose. She just forgets, and so they come over, kind of like, hey, basically getting ready for a confrontation because she stole money from them inadvertently, right. and then she's just like, oh shit, I forgot. Here it is, and they were like, oh thank god, and everything's fine. We didn't suspect you for a minute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that that narratively speaking, I think that's only done to get as many people yes. into that kitchen as possible. They wanted like a pure chaos situation, <laughs> which achieved. Yes, uh, I do love the Capamagis. Uh, they, I think they're a nice because we we have um, 
Rose and Cosmo, which is a Cher's parents, Vincent Gardenia and Olympia Dukakis. And then we have the Capamagis. And they're sort of like a counterbalance to to Rose and Cosmo. Ro- Rose and Cosmo are having trouble. Cosmo's cheating on on Rose, and Rose knows it. So their their sort of vibe vibe has cooled was what I was about yeah, to say. What yeah. person am I? No, you're a real. I'm like a Drake meme. You're a cool uh, cat, Daddy O. That's what you are. <laughs> so their their marriage is sort of I don't want to say on the rocks, but like. Oh, it's definitely on I, the rocks. I guess, yeah, that's, that seems like a you weird put thing. It, it feels like, though, on the rocks would uh, assume that it would end, and I think that yeah. Cosmo would just keep cheating on her until they're dead. Yeah. yeah she confronts him also in this scene, and is basically like, In stop, the last scene, she does, yeah. Stop it, or that's it, you know. I want you to stop seeing her. And he's like, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, but I wanted to talk about the Kapamajis because they have a really sweet scene where, because they're like the counterbalance and they're a, a couple that have been together assumingly about as long as, as Rose and Cosmo. Yeah. And, but they have like a dynamic where it is still cute and playful, or at least in the scenes we see with them. He tells this very weird meandering story when he's out to dinner with uh, Rose and Cosmo about how when Cosmo was dating Rose, there was a big full moon, much like there are over the three days of this movie. That's not how moons <laughs> That's work. That's not how moons work, <laughs> but I'll allow it. I'll allow it. It's also very clear clearly painted background so <laughs> just let it go do you know that originally andy circus was going to play the moon <laughs> they, they couldn't find enough tennis balls to do the motion <laughs> capture so you'd think they just need the one but you need 60 of them they have so he tells this rambling story about how he, you know the big moon was around when they were younger and he thought cosmo brought the moon to his house because he was half asleep and now that moon is happening again and he like gets uh, raymond capomaggi gets up in the middle of the night uh and he sees the moon and he's sort of like a little bit uh, half asleep again and and rita has this sweet moment where she's like you know you stand in there in the light like that with that expression on your face you look about 25 years old. And then he like starts like playfully crawling into bed and she starts playfully swatting at him. It's so cute. It gives me hot eyes every single time. And then later you see them in the store and they're like still like talking about what a great fuck they had last <laughs> night. <laughs> it's very cute. And he um, says, and very look, charming. it's Cosmo's moon when he sees it. Cosmo's moon. <laughs> Another thing you can say anytime you see a full moon or anything that vaguely looks like a moon. I still uh, quote my father the hero, which is, look at the goddamn moon. <laughs> Wait, which one's my father the hero? Gerard Depardieu. Oh, my. And uh, and girl. What's her name? Catherine Heigl. Young oh, baby. Under baby Catherine. siege. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, I wanted to talk about Olympia Dukakis, who's, I feel like she's the MVP of this movie. You feel like but, she's the MVP. I feel like she got a little short shrift. I wanted more Dukakis. Oh, really? I love almost every scene that she's in this movie. I want to point out both Cher and Dukakis won Oscars for their roles in this. Uh, I believe it also won Best Screenplay for John Patrick Shanley. People love this movie. Especially the 1988 Oscars did. I, I, I'm I surprised you... Why don't you talk about why you got? Uh, you feel like she got short shrift before I lost her? Or we well, can do the reverse, whatever you want to do. I think I wanted her to have more because she she's she was uh, we have seen clearly in other movies specifically uh, Steel Magnolias that she has uh, great comic chops and I don't think she got the she didn't get the comic role it's not her like it would have been I just didn't think she had that many funny moments what are the funny moments tell me tell me why I mean I think I mean uh, well she wakes up to to say uh, who's dead when she's being told that her daughter is getting married that's her first line in the movie Um, and she gets to say your rich is Roosevelt which makes me laugh because it's an old timey thing to say she also has her why do men chase women and it's obvious that she's looking for one specific answer and when one guy finally falls ass backwards into it she's like oh yes that's right. That's the answer. I think she's great. I mean, she doesn't have like a lot of like, I don't know if she has a lot of like jokey lines, but I think that she's a really funny character and I like spending time with her, I guess. And I love that she gets this like a uh, play uh, with Frazier's dad. She gets this whole like almost one act play again with, with him where she has dinner with him. And I suspect debates uh, possibly having an affair with him and then pulls back at the last minute. Oh yeah. I don't, I don't think that's, 
under question, is it? We we had a debate when during our viewing. Uh, LT, really? friend of the show, uh, and I debated, by which I mean yelled at each other, uh, <laughs> about whether or not Olympia Dukakis was debating fucking Frazier's dad. It was at least a, uh, what do you call, a like... Uh, An illusion? No, An like illusion? A- no, at least a like spiritual infidelity at the very least. You know what I mean? Like she right. was like clearly thinking about what it would be like to be with this man or more importantly, not with her husband. You know what I mean? Like just being with a man who seems to want to spend time with her. Yes, exactly. Um, but you're the, the debate was whether she had that feeling at all or she was like never going to. I mean, she like had dinner with well, him and I, like had a romantic walk home. LT's stance is that that she knows who she is and she would have never slept with John Mahoney and she's not even thinking about it. My stance was that there there's a scene where they're walking down the street and she they look at each other while they're talking and laughing uh, and then John Mahoney looks back uh, forward as does Olympia but then she turns back to look at him again which I feel like is movie language for let's do I this. think I really like you or let's do this let's bump uglies cut line from the movie let's bump uglies. <laughs> Uh, and then Moonstruck she runs two. into her father-in-law. <laughs> Moonstruck 2, colon, let's bump uglies. Then she runs into her father-in-law. Old man. Oh, there's another jokey line. That's a line I quote from Olympia Dukakis all the time. Old man, if you give any more of my food to those dogs, I'm going to kick you till you're dead. I'm going to kick you till you're dead. <laughs> what a charming woman. She runs into her father-in-law, and I think that's the moment where she's like, no, I know who I am. I have a relationship with Cosmo. I need to confront him on this. Also, I've been witnessed by someone. <laughs> so good point. Uh, it's, it's easy to jump on your high horse <laughs> because you haven't done anything yet. But yeah, I mean, she was essentially on an impromptu date. Yes. But like, and it's a very cute. That is also a very cute scene, I think. Yeah, it's, it is. It is nice because you also see like this guy who is clearly like a womanizer jackass, but he's like. Also, a professor at NYU. This is also, he's seen in the first scene where Danny yeah. Aiello and Cher are having dinner in the same Italian restaurant. He gets rejected by a woman he's he's dating, gets water thrown on him. And then again in this scene, when Olympia Dukakis goes to dinner alone, she sees pretty much a mirrored scene of him getting uh, and that also conf- by a woman. confused me because I think it was the it was too far apart in the movie or the women that he was dating looked too similar because I was like, are we in like a time loop thing? And they did it on purpose, (laughs) but I was also like, are like, what's happening right now? But obviously it, it wasn't until like they started having dinner together. I was like, Oh, this is later. That was a different woman. He explains kind of the situation. So I got it. But at first I was very confused. You were like my mother asking me questions. I'm like, I, we're both watching the movie, Phyllis. Let's, Just let's let the movie answer the questions. Let's, yeah, let's let this play out and see what happens. I don't know, another 30 minutes or so? <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess I uh, I don't think – it's not like Olympia Dukakis did a bad job or anything. I just – she wasn't a feature to me, and she's such a – I wish she was more, I guess. I mean, I certainly wouldn't reject if, – if you have more Dukakis in the back – Please go back and check. bring it on. A, can you check on that? Bring it Maybe? on. I, I, a thirty-three inch waist Sick. in a Dukakis would be perfect. But no, I love her in this movie. Um, I feel like she is the 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 not the hero for me, but she is my my MVP for this movie. If Chrissy wasn't in the movie, oh yeah, I'm gonna. That's have to, our my Catherine O'Hara. Yeah, I'm gonna uh, have to go there. Memorial. Or at least the uh, Sally Field One Scene Award. Oh, yeah. There you go. There she you can't go. win they both, can, though. She's can, ineligible. We can get, Once you win one, you can't win yeah, the other. Then we can kind of split the vote. I, I appreciate that. But I mean, I, I noticed this time, this is something I hadn't noticed before, that Olympia Dukakis moans a lot, like quietly moans uh, huh, uh, during scenes when she is uh, dealing with something. She does it while she's praying at church huh, after she reveals that she knows uh, that Cosmo's cheating. I think she does it when when uh, she offers the house to Cher when Cher uh, is still you know after the day after when when Danielle leaves she's saying well you can live here and we'll we'll move away or something uh, and she goes I would I love the house I'm not gonna live here because Pop don't like Johnny and she's like you're right he doesn't like him huh <laughs> she says it to herself <laughs> it's a weird little tick hmm. Olympia has this question why do men chase women. And she's, she has an answer already, which is that they fear death. But what I liked about this movie, I feel like, again, a lesser movie would make the men have sort of straw man arguments that would be easily, like, fall apart under scrutiny. But I feel like both men 
Danny Alesso, but like uh, John Mahoney has actually a very in character response to that question, which is like, I'm an old fart. I feel like my life's gone nowhere. And these young, young girls, uh, when they hear me lecturing the same lecture I've given for the past 20 years, that it's all new to them and they're excited about it. And that excitement uh, excites me. And I just want to be around them because they're. Um, they're excited to learn about this stuff. And then um, and then they realize I'm just an old fuddy-duddy and they throw water in my face. And then, of course, Olympia's like, I think it's because men fear death. Uh, Danny Aiello has a story about Adam's rib and that Eve is trying to get it back, which Olympia does not care for. Why yeah. would a man need more than one woman? I like the idea, though, that, that like, John Mahoney's <laughs> character is like, uh, there's no, like, they're just going to eventually throw water in my face. Like, there's no way around it. I'm like, clearly you're being an ass. Well, that's what she's, she sort of responds in that vein, yeah. saying what you don't know about women is a lot. Yeah. Oh, she also, you know what? I'm not so defensive about Olympia Dukakis. She gets a great line in the final scene where, or she has many great lines in that final scene, but the one that makes me laugh is when Cher is like, finds out that Johnny Camareri is back from Palermo. She starts, uh, Cher starts freaking out and, you know, trying to get out of her, uh, her, uh, opera dress and into like casual clothes and Olympia Dukakis with very Italian hands going like a choo-choo train. She's like, you got a love bite on your neck. Your life is going down the toilet. It makes me laugh every time. Oh, can we talk about that, that final scene, which I feel like is again, another one act play in and of itself. Sure. We sort of touched on it, but it's, it's a uh, very, I think it's very funny. Um, but it's also very tense because now Cher knows that Johnny Camerari is back from Palermo, uh, and that his mother is miraculously healed. It's modern times. They ain't supposed to be miracles no more. It ain't modern times in Sicily. Another Olympia Dukakis line that I like. I think it's all attitude in this movie. Like if you wrote it down, I'd be like, these are all lines. But I think getting all these really strong character actors together to deliver them, like, I, feed it to me directly like applesauce, please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Here comes the airplane. <laughs> By the way, what I like, this might be a flaw in the movie, but I kind of like it, is that Danny Aiello disappears from the movie for the middle hour. Like, he's in that first scene, he goes to Palermo, yeah, he right. calls at one point, and then he's gone. He's mentioned a few times, but every time that airport, airport shot starts, I'm like, what is this part again? Because you see the lights at the airport, I'm like, what is this? And then the plane lands, I'm like, oh, right, Danny Aiello's in this movie. I completely <laughs> forgot. And it is this weird, he, he's not threatening in any way, but it is this sort of like, you sort of, I feel like you sort of feel what Cher will feel like in 10 minutes when she also finds out, which is like, oh shit, that right. guy I agreed to marry, he's here in this country again. <laughs> it is this sort of, you get this sinking feeling of like, fuck, I was hoping you would die in Palermo, maybe. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's, I have a few bigger things, but you you, you uh, were saying you, you had some uh, big what have you. After all this and the sort of slice of life and the vignettes and the like different levels of love, like with the different couples, like, do you believe in life after love? <laughs> stop that. If I could turn back time, I would stop you from saying that joke. <laughs> I did note this, this, my, I've probably watched this movie a dozen times at least. Um, you don't say. I do say. <laughs> this is the first time, though, that I noticed how a st strong a motif of death is in this movie, despite mm. no one actually dying in this movie. Your first shot outside of the credits is a corpse in a funeral home. You uh, have Danny Aiello's mother dying, but she doesn't eventually. There's a miracle. You have the opera that ends in a death. You have Rose. Her first line is asking who's dead, wondering why there's such a commotion in the house. You have that old woman who puts a curse on a plane. <laughs> At the airport, this deranged woman, very old world woman, dressed in all like black widow's clothes, and I of don't course, even curses. I don't either. <laughs> and I don't either. I wish the black waters of the Atlantic Ocean would swallow her up. <sighs> uh, Cher's first husband, of course, and uh, R Rose's question that she's constantly searching for the answer of. Hmm. What do you think they were trying to get at with that? Well, I think it goes, I think the, it ties into what I think is the thesis of this movie, which is Nicolas Cage's weird, also overdramatic speech, uh, 
near the tail end of the movie where he says that, you know, love isn't like what it's supposed to be in the storybooks. It's supposed to be messy and you're supposed to break your heart and then we die. You're supposed to, you're not supposed to marry Danny Aiello. You're supposed to be fucking me. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Until you die. Yeah. Or someone gets hit by a bus. I mean, unless you want me to start quoting Vincent Gardenia, I think I'm, I'm good. Let's go to the verdict. <laughs> DJ, I'm actually very curious about this. Yeah, I definitely I'm very wanna... nervous. Your eyes have flared at me, Chrissy style, a few <laughs> times when I've been talking. Um, so I want to ask you, sir, what is your verdict of this yeah, movie? I'm, I'm glad I'm going first because I also think yours will be more entertaining. <laughs> than, <laughs> so it's hard for me to say your inner child is an idiot because I don't. this is not a bad movie, but I also didn't get it. Like, I think this is just like not for me. So gotcha. I have to say... Your inner child is an idiot only because I don't want to watch this again. I didn't like, there are moments that I really enjoyed. Uh, and it's, I don't think anybody did anything wrong. <laughs> like it's, it's nobody's fault. No one's at funny, fault here. I like, I like, I can see academically the funny moments, but it didn't really make me laugh. If that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like uh, the, 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 Best example of the funny scene is like the 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 Chrissy scene and the I call it the Chrissy scene. <laughs> Nicholas Cage's like introduction is like funny, but also like I don't it doesn't work for me emotionally because it's like this guy's clearly a toxic, violent asshole. <laughs> Even though it's played for laughs, I appreciate the laughs, but it also makes me go like it makes me feel like defensive for or like protective of Cher's character. Where I'm like, don't Loretta get out of what there. What are you doing? I mean, you don't have to be with Danny Aiello, but don't get involved in the, whatever this is. And I do like, um, I like this sort of spotlights on the other couples, but the one I liked the most was the one we get the least amount of time with, which was the, the liquor store couple. <laughs> I wanted like, <laughs> I wanted more there. So I guess it just all like kind of fell flat for me. It did, I didn't um, kind of, I just didn't get it. And I want to like, I want to hear you fight for it because I obviously know that you enjoy this more, but I also like, I don't think that all of a sudden I'm going to enjoy it. You know what I mean? I, I like, I hear you saying like, Oh, this was great. And this was great. And this is great. But I'm like, yeah, okay. You know what I mean? Like I can see that. Uh -huh. um, but it doesn't, it just doesn't, it doesn't work for me. And I, I think I might be emotionally too sensitive about uh, older relatives dying right now, but like the, it really got off on the wrong foot by like being really flippant about his mom dying and like not caring about it and playing it for laughs. It is funny that you brought that up because it's something that I've never questioned at all in my view. Yeah, I think, and it's obviously made to be a joke, but I'm also like, I don't get it. And I got kind of stuck on it. Uh huh. And so that may be a me problem. <laughs> My mom is fine, but uh, it's been a it's been a rough couple of years for me and a lot of people. So I think I gotcha. that I'm a little bit more sensitive about that. But um, I don't think that's the movie's fault. So yeah, your inner child is an idiot, but also said with a asterisk of like it's. I just it, I didn't get it. You've never been more wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you did get it. <laughs> I, in fact, did get it. Oh, I've moved the computer too close. I look like the Wizard of Oz. Um, <laughs> I. I mean, I, I think it's very clear. Your inner child is not an idiot. This movie is a great. I think if you like uh, romantic movies in general, romantic comedies specifically, I think this is a near perfect example of those. I think there are little qualms here and there. I think it's a great ensemble piece. Uh, I think it works really as a lot of vignettes. Um, even if you're not into uh, Nicolas Cage, you know, being very operatic, I feel like there's another story in there. I feel like all the cat, what I, one of the things I I love about this movie is that every character from Chrissy up to Cher gets like, if not a full like story arc, like something to sink their teeth into Yeah, from liquor store couple that we just see like for three minutes to Bobo, the Italian American waiter who looks like some sort of Jeff Dunham puppet to <laughs> Perry, the NYU professor. Olympia Dukakis sorting through her marriage. I get hot eyes every time, uh, you know, she asks if she's been a good wife. Every time. All the way up to, to Nicolas Cage and, and, uh, and Cher. Uh, I love that, that everyone gets something to sink their teeth into, and every character seems 
fleshed out and even if there's not a lot on the page the actor brings a lot of like lived in like ness to that character like yeah. Raymond and Rita Capomaggi could have been very forgotten but they're like very charming in this movie uh in just being this sort of childlike love even you know 40 some odd years into their marriage there is like a a, a sort of ethereal nature to this that um if it were tipped over maybe one or two more notches it would push me away but it's just enough you know hey sometimes the moon gets really big and people fall in love right I'm like okay <laughs> uh bella luna sure whatever you say old man and his dogs it's it's very charming there's something about this movie that just i think because it it feels so lived in and um both somehow campy and very grounded at the same time that I get swept away in it every time I watch it. It's one of those movies mm. that if I stumble upon it, it's like, I'm sorry, I have to see this through. Uh, it's my desperado, essentially. <laughs> uh, Tyler, in fact, we had just watched it on New Year's Eve. Tyler stumbled upon it on HBO, um, and it was about, I think it was at the opera scenes. Uh, and I was like, I was standing there, for 15 minutes, I was about to go draw, I think. And I was standing there with one leg up on the uh, arm of the couch, standing there. I'm like, well, I'm probably just, you know, it's just about 15 more minutes until they get to the kitchen scene. So I might as well just see this through. Um, <laughs> I will say this, uh, in your defense, I guess. Um, now, you don't have someone who will force you to watch it under duress. But Tyler, <laughs> when we first watched it, he did not care for this movie. Yeah. He did not like... he. The minute we turned it off, he was like, they've known each other for three days. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, actually, that's a generous reading because she doesn't meet him until the second day of the movie. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, it's one of those things that there is like a certain amount of suspend your disbelief a little bit. Yeah. And Tyler, actually, the other day- The tides would be going crazy with the size of this movie. <laughs> yeah, we'd all be drowned. The other day when we sat down to watch it on New Year's, uh, Tyler admitted, like, it's kind of grown on me. And then, I mean, he was the one who put it on uh, when I was walking through the living room the other day. And then he sat with me again when I watched it for the second time for for our recording. So I think he's all in. I think I think if you ignore the plot, it's also a very like quotable movie. It's almost like the yeah. gay version of The Big Lebowski. Like the plot's right. not really that important. That's Let's just the hear reason. these people yeah. right. like, say ridiculous things to each other. And I think I said during the intro, like there is no weak link in this cast. Like everyone seems uh, real. Like Vincent Gardinia, who I barely even talked about in this, he charms me even though he's a philandering uh, con artist from the vibe we get from his brief scene of him actually doing plumbing work where he tricks someone into getting copper yeah. pipes. Yeah. It's the only pipe I use. Yeah, I just, I, I, I think it's a near flawless movie for me in terms of being like a romantic comedy. It's like an arch, like it's a peak example of romantic comedy. When, it, when it's working for you, it should be like Moonstruck. I would rather just read Cher's Twitter feed for <laughs> uh, the amount of time, the length of this movie. <laughs> oh my God. With the caps lock share. And you know she can turn it off because it's not always on. Now that's my shit. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. Oh my God. What do you think, everybody? Your inner child is an idiot at gmail.com. Send us an email. You can leave us a text or a voicemail, 615-576-0525. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Instagram. Uh, Damon is getting right on that TikTok profile. He's still oh, yeah. he's I'm, building up a batch of videos, and he's going to be releasing. Well, there's a lot of choreography to learn, mostly arms, arm-based yeah. choreography, yeah. which is not my strength. You could just post yourself doing drawings, man. You can do TikTok is not just TikTok dances, Damon. Sorry, TikTok no is sponsoring this No one wants to see a balding 40-year-old man drawing on TikTok. You'd be surprised. <laughs> well, maybe if I show my feet, they might actually Yeah, there's watch. also that. <laughs> you can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash your inner child is an idiot. We want to thank our current patrons, including the elusive fan Gromkin. Uh, Brianna Bailey. Shit on the cartouche. Oh, Brianna, let us know if it's as Brianna or Brianna. Yeah, just, just tell us and we will... Just scream it. it into your iPhone. <laughs> that should do it. Uh, I can't promise we'll go back and edit previous episodes. We will pronounce it correctly from then on. Kevin from Cleveland, you are also a patron. 
Josh Frigo. The supreme ruler of this podcast. Dramatically placed hot dog. Travis Vance. Damon's Australian accent. His honor the mayor. Dan McIntyre. Beth Sermont. David Mort. <laughs> Jonathan Day. Just cuz. Scalphosaurus. Dr. Uh, Malcolm's uh, heaving bosom. Heather Tuggle. Tyler Richardson. Captain Jean-Luc Picard. T. Smith. Karen Curd. Lindsay Nell. The Zesty. Jeremy Powlin. Particle Man. And Larissa Maestro. Thank you all very, very, very much. We really appreciate your support. Uh, if you want to support like them, patreon.com slash you know child is an idiot. I've seen a wolf in every person I've ever met, and I see a wolf in you. I feel like the first part of what she says makes the second part not as important. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if, if he's a wolf and everyone's a wolf, what the fuck's the problem? Let, it, let just, him leer at those women. I guess we're all just wolves then, huh? Hey, DJ. Yeah. You know what? What? You standing there with the light hitting your face like that? With yeah. that expression on your face? Yeah. You look like about 25 years old.